Welcome to another episode of Alia Money Talks, brought to you by Blue and White Finance. I'm excited for today's discussion on a topic that's probably relevant to every single person listening to here, which is setting up a basic will, writing, writing a will here in Israel, right? We're all going to die whether we like it or not, and being prepared for that eventuality uh, in the best way possible for our loved ones and for the people that we care about is an important topic that everybody doesn't want to deal with but needs to deal with. So with that, I'm really excited to bring on today's guest, Miriam Shotsky. Miriam, why don't you tell us about yourself, introduce yourself to, the, to our audience, and tell us about your work and your platform and all of that. Okay. Hi, Aaron. First of all, I want to say how happy I am to be here. I love what you guys are doing at Blue and White Finance. I think it's a great tool. Um, and really, you. obviously your listeners know about it, but I really, I can't praise it enough. I think it's such a great asset. I am uh, an Israeli lawyer, Israeli licensed. I was born in the US and my parents made Aliyah when I was really young. So I was raised here. They did all the hard work for me. Um, I've been practicing law since 2007 in the general field of family law, but for several years now, I've been focusing on planning for aging and estate planning. Most of my clients are the Anglo, from the Anglo community in Israel or people from abroad who own property here, people who usually prefer to receive service in English. Um, and on top of that, as of a few months ago, I am the proud founder of EasyWill, which is an online platform to prepare wills easily in an affordable and accessible manner in Israel. Great. Congratulations on the on the new platform. Looking forward to hearing a bit more about that later in the in the discussion. I guess to get us get us started, um, who needs will and why? OK, so the truth is, it's easier and shorter to say who does not need a will. OK, so first category of people who don't need a will is people who are still young, not yet settled, still single, who don't really have a lot of assets they can get away with not having a will because they don't have much to, to bequeath and they don't have a family to take care of, okay? The other category of people who may not need a will is people who are older, okay? Whose children, who have children, but their children are all adults and they're on their own, okay? So they're not married, maybe they've been widowed or maybe they're divorced and their kids are all healthy. And what they would want is for everything to go to their kids in equal portions. That is the default arrangement by law in Israel if you are single and have children. So in that case, you may not need a will. Even someone in that situation might still want to make certain changes. Sometimes it's even just, oh, I want to leave this diamond ring to that daughter or specific little things like that. But generally, those are the two categories of people who do not, do not need a will. Anybody else needs a will in Israel. Good. So to drill down on that that exact point, right? Okay. Um, you know, in, uh, in, in the in the situation where you you know you don't die without a will, right? Let's say you're married. Let's say you're not married. What are the basics? What's the default option? You know, could you just break okay. that down for us? So, Somebody who dies without a will in Israel. Right. Okay. So if if you die without a will, and that does happen, there's a default op option in the law. That basically says, well, we, we're going to assume that this is how you wanted things to be divided. And that depends on family circumstances. Now, before I get into that specific example, what many people are surprised to hear, especially people from the U.S., is that the joint marital home and the joint bank account do not automatically transfer to the surviving spouse. OK, so let's say. We have, let's take a, a, a typical family, okay? We have the husband, the wife, and a few children. And let's say they own their home jointly, 50-50, right? 50% each, and they have a joint bank account. If one of them passes away, then we look at the estate, okay? An estate is everything a person owned at the point of when he or she died, okay? And that estate includes half of the apartment, half of the bank account, and everything else that they, that, that they might have. OK, so if someone passes away without a will and they were married and had children, half of their estate goes to the spouse and half goes to the children. So what would happen in the scenario that I just described is that the surviving spouse ends up with 
three quarters total of the apartment, right? Because they owned half and they got another quarter from the estate. And that remaining quarter gets divided among all the children. Okay, and this can be problematic for a number of reasons. Okay, if we're talking about a young family and the children are minors, then if the parent wants to sell the apartment, they need to get court approval to do so because any real estate transaction, transaction involving minors requires court approval. And same with the joint bank account, then that money is sort of put aside for the minor children until they reach age 18. If we're talking about adult children, then we have other types of risks such as um, possible family problematic dynamics between the children and the parent. Um, we might have a situation where one of the kids has creditors, right? Maybe they got into debt. And then if mom's house has a portion on the son's name and he's in financial trouble, they can put their hands on that portion and cause a lot of trouble for the usually aging parent at that point. Yeah, those are, those are all really important points. I think everybody needs to... I think that you know any married couple that that thinks about this and sees, wow, it's possible that if God forbid something happened to me, I haven't taken care of this, that this all this all of my assets wouldn't naturally pass to my spouse. You know um, that can be very concerning, and that's something very important to to point out. Another common example I think that we we encounter is you know we deal with a lot of Olim, we deal with a lot of people that that are coming from another country. Um, whether it's recently or they've been here for a while, if somebody right. makes Aliyah with an existing will, right? Now they maybe they bring some of their assets over, maybe they keep some of their assets there, and, and we'll get into those nuances. But what you know, what happens if somebody already has a will? Should they be exploring the idea of having a will in Israel as well? Okay, right. So I, th that's exactly my client base. So I get asked that question all the time. Right. The answer exactly. is almost always you need an Israeli will. Okay, not in every single scenario, but usually you are much better off preparing a new will for Israel. Okay, now that does not mean we are necessarily going to revoke or cancel their existing will. Okay, let's say they came from the US and they have an American will in place. We might leave that valid for the US and then create a will specifically for Israel. Now I wanna explain why. Most people think, oh, it's an American will, it's not valid here. No, it probably is valid here, but it's not the best plan and that can actually cause a lot more of a headache than people realize. And I wanna give some concrete examples of why that is. Um, first and foremost, a very basic thing in Israel, Israel's very, very big, I'm sure you guys have realized this, on two dot zehut numbers, right? And on ID numbers in general. The American wills never list ID numbers, okay? So that's just a technical identification problem that could cause a lot of headache to the inheritors. And what's worse, sometimes the US wills don't even name the exact inheritors. I've seen this a number of times where the US will could say it goes to my issue, right? My issue means my children, my grandchildren, et cetera. Children. <laughs> it doesn't name them, okay? And then we have to jump through hoops to prove who the issue is, right? Who these kids are and that there aren't any additional children who are being hidden away, right? I don't know if you know, there's an expression in Hebrew, lech tochayach she'en lech achot, right? Go prove you don't have a sister, right? Which is about the difficulty of proving a negative. Here, you sometimes yeah. literally have to prove you don't have a sister, yeah. okay? Now, if we're talking about a complete Israeli family, they're all in the system with two dots of hoop numbers, it's easy enough to prove. If we're talking about a couple that made Aliyah, have two children that live in the States still, Israel doesn't know of their existence. Right. So it's a whole long process just to awesome. prove who the heirs are instead of just naming them clearly and specifically in an Israeli will. Now, that's a technical reason. Usually we can overcome it with some work and time and effort. Um, but often we don't want to apply foreign wills, especially U.S. wills, because they either create trusts or send assets into a U.S. trust. Trusts are very common in um, U.S. estate planning. Yes. Um, they're not, not so here. We don't use trusts nearly as often here in Israel, A, because we don't need to, and B, because it's not as um, implemented here. It's kind of difficult. In some cases, we need it, but not as a standard estate planning. Okay, so if you have a U.S. will that says, I leave everything to my issue or goes into trust, 
you're better off not using that will here in Israel. You're better off having one that's clear, simpler, doesn't contain a lot of the things that we have in U.S. wills, but does contain the important information um, that we want to have here in Israel. Yeah, makes sense. Um, I'll just point out for, for the listener that we did have a more comprehensive uh, topic where we talked a lot about trust and, and estate planning involving trusts, specifically in the U.S. and how you know it's a lot more complicated to use trust in Israel. So if you're interested right. in that kind of whole topic, definitely, definitely go. We're going to focus here on on kind of the ABCs of writing a will in, in Israel and the basics here. Drilling down some of the terminology that that we hear, can you explain to me what a mutual will is, um, how how they work, yes. what that means? Yeah. Okay, so there's a lot of misunderstanding around it. People think, oh, we're coming as a couple to make a will, and it's basically going to be a mirror will, right? I'm leaving it to you, you're leaving it to me, and then we're leaving it to the kids, and that makes it a mutual will. That's not necessarily a mutual will, that's a mirror will. A mutual will is almost like a mini contract, okay? So when you're creating your wills, if you're creating a mutual wills, there's a reliance on each other, okay? If I'm creating a will with my husband, I'm relying on what he's writing on his, in his will, and he's relying on my will, and we're agreeing together not to unilaterally change that will down the line, okay? Without informing the other person or only, or, or after the other person passes away. A basic principle, principle of inheritance law is that any person who writes a will can always change it whenever they please, right? You're not bound by a will that you created in the past. The exception to that rule is a mutual will, which when you're creating with your spouse, you're agreeing that you can only change it under certain circumstances, okay? Now, when you're both alive and well, the only real limitation that you can put in place is that you have to notify the other person before going ahead and changing your will, but, the will would also include instructions about what happens after one spouse passes away. Can I change my will then? Under what circumstances, what changes can I add? Okay, and the idea of mutual wills is to give a person who's writing the will higher certainty of what's going to happen and what's going to be implemented after he or she pass away. Now, with every arrangement, I say there are advantages and disadvantages. My personal opinion is that the older the couple is, the more it might make sense to have mutual wills. But when we're talking about a younger couple and they have decades and decades ahead of them, I am more hesitant to create a mutual will that might be locking them in for a whole bunch of unknown and un unforeseen scenarios in the future. Um, what I will say, here's an important tip. A couple needs to sit and decide together what's suitable for them, right? If they want a mutual will, if they don't want a mutual will, what the terms are going to be, and that's fine. There's no right or wrong. But here's what I would say. If you are going to choose to have a mutual will, do not use the default arrangement by law. It's not a good arrangement, and whatever lawyer you go to to write your will should know to explain what the different options are and to introduce different arrangements than what the default is by law, okay? And another important tip is let's say you decided, no, we don't wanna have mutual wills, we want them to be open and simple, etc. No problem, make sure that is spelled out in your will. Because if you go together, you write mirror wills, you're signing them on the same day in the same office, right? And it doesn't say anything, they can be interpreted as mutual wills, and then down the line, if you want to change it, suddenly you find yourself locked into a situation where you absolutely do not intend to be. A lot of people ask, is a mutual will one document or is it two separate wills? How does that work? So it is legally possible to have the mutual will be all in one document. Um, I, My professional opinion is that is not a good idea. I never have it in one document. I always have a document for the has been a document for the wife. Of course, you'll have other lawyers who uh, who think differently, but um, you know they say two Jews, three opinions, right? So like two Jews lawyers, five yes. opinions. As one would expect. Um, so in a situation where 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 somebody is, let's say your typical couple, they have a few kids, 
they are watching this and they're ready to get serious about uh, making a will. They've, you know, they, they realize that this is something they really, really do need. Um, what are some important decisions they have to think about? You know, bef as they come to that meeting with, with the lawyer, as they use a platform like yours, what are these kind of tough, sometimes tough and personal decisions? We talked about the mutual will decision. Right. What are some of the other ones that, that might, might be relevant to start? Right, okay, so just as, as far as-, as a couple. Right. So, of course, there's just the, the technical aspect of gathering information, right, which is usually your two dads with a sefach, right, that blue paper that lists your kids and their ID uh, and their names and ID numbers and some other information, right, like details of the home, et cetera. But that's the, that's the easy stuff, right? The first question is, how are we dividing it, right? Are, is everything going to get divided equally? And in most cases, the answer is yes, and that's what it should be. Um, however, there might be some equalizing or evening out that has to happen soon or before everything is divided equally. What do I mean by that? Let's take a family where maybe some of the kids are already in their 20s, right? They, they've gotten higher education, they've gotten married, and maybe the parents even helped them uh, with a down payment towards an apartment, house. right? But there's also, let's say, a 15 or 13-year-old kid in that family. So this large amount of money that these parents gave to the older child, they might have another, you know, more of that money put aside for the younger children who haven't received it yet. They may want to say in the will, if, at, you know, at, at the time of our passing, our younger children did not yet get a gift for a down payment or some for their wedding, etc. First, give them that, take it off the top, and then divide it equally. So people have to consider, do they want to do that? What's the amount they're going to put in there? What are the terms of when the child gets the money? Okay, and the same goes for loans, by the way. Sometimes parents give their children loans and we want to address that in the will. Did they have to, does that will, does that loan get deducted from that child right. portion of the estate? Okay, but let's take it up a notch, okay? If we're talking about parents who have children under 18, then, and this is a very difficult question, people get stuck on this a lot, especially Olim, you have to think about if, God forbid, something happens to both of you, who is going to raise your children? Yeah. And so many people have come to me and said, for years, we didn't write a will because we didn't know what we would write. We, did, we don't know who to choose. And sometimes it's because they're not settled here enough yet, or sometimes it's because family members are far away back in the States. Far away. Yeah. Now, I, I kind of want to, I want to bust a myth here. Okay. If you don't have a will that, that says who, who you would like your kids to go to, it does not mean that the country is going to take your kids, okay? Take your kids. I've heard that. I don't know where that came from. The country has enough to do. They don't need your kids, okay? Yes. Now, another myth is that under no circumstances will my children be allowed to leave the country, okay? That is not true. However, when you choose to write in your will who you would want to raise your kids, at the end of the day, the final decision is made by a family court that looks at what the child's best interests are. Okay, so it will look at individual circumstances. If a young family makes aliyah, God forbid, a year later, half a year later, something happens to the parents and they had a will saying, I want the kids to go back to the States to, um, to my parents. The kids are not that settled here and they probably still have a close enough relationship with their grandparents there that that would be strongly considered, right? On the other hand, if we're talking about kids who have lived here their entire lives and barely know this family member from abroad, that would also be looked at differently. But it's the, the judge looks at it at an individual level, okay? There's no specific no, this child cannot leave the country ever rule. Okay. So, so your will is a request, um, so meaning what you write in the will is going to be a request for what you want the courts to do, but it's not necessarily exactly. a guarantee that the courts the will choose that courts, as the best interest, right? Yeah. But at the end of the day, what, what needs to happen is the court needs to give an order, a guardianship order, um, who's going to be the guardian for this child, right? Or these children. Okay. So the court, of course, gives due weight to what the parents chose because they assume that the parents are acting in the best interest of the child and know what's best for them. But it's not the only factor. And they look at the entire, uh, all the circumstances that the kids are in. If the kids are older, they'll ask the kids what their preference is as well. 
right? You're not going to ask a two-year-old, but you absolutely would ask a 15, 16 year old. So that's absolutely part of it. Another important thing to consider is who's going to handle the kids' finances, right? So it might be the same person that you're choosing as guardian, but it might be somebody else. And you might say, I want it to be someone else and I'm appointing them as a trustee and I want them to manage the property past age 18. Because in Israel, yeah. 18 is legal adult age, right? So anything that was managed for a child until age 18 is handed over to them at that age. If you choose to appoint a trustee, then they can hold it to age 21, 23, a little bit longer. They can use it for higher education and so on and so forth. There's a little bit more room for um, further details and instructions there. So that's also an important point to consider. And another, this is the most difficult thing, okay, that people always need some time to think about is the question of limitations in the will, right? Of what kind of limitations are we imposing on each other, the spouses, or on other inheritors? And in what and how are we doing that? So one type of limitation is we already talked about is the mutual will, right? You can only change your will under these and those circumstances. Um, another type of limitation is something that's called successive beneficiaries, okay? It's in Hebrew, it's called yoresh achar yoresh, okay? Which means first, I'm leaving everything to you or a specific asset to you, but after you pass away, my portion that I gave you of that asset must go, let's say, to the children. Let's say a husband Please. and a wife pass away. Now, a husband, my husband and I make, make a will together, right? So my will as the wife could say, I'm leaving you, my husband, uh, my half of the apartment, okay? But, and you, and, and I'll pass away first and you'll inherit it, but 30, 40, 50 years later, when you pass away, that half of the apartment goes straight to our kids. Okay, and, and that would be in effect, even if let's say my husband did change his will. Okay, because what he received from me has a carry, it, it has like an instruction with it that says, okay, it's yours now, but it's waiting to be passed on to the children. Okay. And that's specifically for in, in the event of a second marriage or, you know, that's, that's kind of one of the considerations. That's right? the concern, right? The concern is, of uh, the, the family assets leaking out to a new spouse, new children, et cetera. Now here, there's not necessarily a right or a wrong, right? It's what's suitable for that couple, right? Some couples say, great, if I'm gone and you remarry, that's wonderful. And you want to have more children, have more children. I know you're not going to desert our children. I know you're going to look after them and that's fine. Other people say, and it's just as legitimate, they say, we worked so hard to accumulate what we had, to finally buy a place, to finally do all these things. I want to know that what we built together is going only to our children. And that's also fine. Sure. So that's yeah. not an easy discussion, but that's a very important one right. to have as part of the drawing up yeah. a will. And another right. point that's yeah, so important. These are... um, yeah, please. Yeah. No, jump There's in. the whole issue of pensions, kupot gemel, kranot hishtalmut, bituach menahalim, okay? Those are officially considered external to one's estate because you can list beneficiaries directly on those policies. However, you can't just ignore them when you're writing a will, okay? It's something that you have to take into consideration, right? You're, when you're writing a right. will, you're talking about how am I transferring my wealth after I pass away, right? Whatever I accumulated. And usually in Israel, especially if you've lived here for a while, you do accumulate significant assets that fall into that category. Yeah. So along with preparing a will, you're going to want to make sure the beneficiaries listed reflect part of what the entire plan is supposed to be. That makes sense. Yeah. So we've kind of talked about all these different considerations. These are obviously tough personal conversations, but very important yeah. for any spouse, any partners to to kind of go through uh, and really get clarity on. One more, I guess, um, more rare case, but something important to, to maybe address. Um, beyond just a minor child, what if the child has special needs? Is there any extra considerations um, that, that need to be, be put beyond what we've spoken about uh, in that will? Absolutely. Yeah. So, right. So what happens is if we have a child with special needs, 
So the first question is where exactly they fall on that spectrum, right? How yeah. much assistance do they need? For example, is this someone who has or will have um, a guardian appointed for them? Or is it just someone who needs a little bit of extra protection? Maybe you don't want to hand the money over to them completely and directly. You want a little bit of supervision on it. So that's, you know, when I sit with um, clients who have a child with special needs, we sort of try to map out what the child's needs are and what their capabilities are. On the one hand, if the child is able to exercise some independence, you don't want to take that away from them too much. Right. Okay. But on the other hand, you do want to protect them. You don't want them to, you don't want to hand them a large sum of money and then have someone take advantage of them and then it's all gone. So in these cases, a will could include instructions for guardians for adults, okay, adults with disabilities. Okay. And if it's someone who we feel doesn't quite need a guardian, then once again, we could appoint a trustee. It could usually be one of the other siblings that manages the money for, um, for the special needs child. Another thing that we look at and take into consideration is whether or not we want to just leave everything equally across the board or sort of change that a little bit in the sense that we'll leave a lump sum of money to the special needs child instead of giving them a slice of the apartment. And that's for right. the simple reason that once again, if we're talking about someone that has a guardian appointed, then any real estate transaction requires court approval. So if we have enough that we can give them a nice sum of money put aside for them to look after them, care for all their needs, and then leave the apartment, let's say, to the rest of our children, and they have a little bit more freedom on how to manage it or when to sell it, et cetera, that's also something to consider. It's not always what we choose to do, but it's something that I raise as an option um, to the parents. And another thing that's important to do is we, we want to maintain our child's um, quality of life, right? So even if, let's say, they're living in uh, a special facility, and all of their needs are taken care of, and they get money from Bituach Lomi. We usually there's still additional things we want to get them. You know, clothing. We want to make sure they have a phone or an iPad. Um, sometimes we want to make sure that they'll get out and visit their siblings. So that might mean paying for a special hasada, take them back and forth, so that that burden isn't on the rest of the children. We'll put instructions into the will to use the money for all those yeah, things and maintain that quality of life and maintain the family connection. Yeah, makes sense. Great, those are great, some great tips. Uh, if we fast forward, somebody completes their will, they sign, they do all the necessary steps that, that are gonna be involved, mm -hmm. where should they keep this will? Um, you know, is it a, okay. a dusty drawer in, in the back of a closet or, you know, who needs a copy? So it really depends on the individual, right? And I always ask them, do you trust yourself to keep important documents? Um, so first of all, the important thing is sign more than one original. Okay, this isn't common in other countries. In Israel, it's it's always done. I always recommend sign three. Sometimes people want to sign four, but keep have more than one original because yeah. after Mavestream, right after the person passes away, you need to submit an original for probate. A certified copy isn't enough. A scanned copy isn't enough. You need to have an original. Okay, so what do we do with it? Obviously, you're going to keep one copy in a safe place. If you have a safe, great. If you have a filing cabinet with a lock, also good. Wherever you keep your important documents, that's where you should keep your will. That's number one. Okay. Number two, you may want to hand one original over to someone whom you really trust, right? So if we're talking about a young family, you may want to give a copy to your parents or to the person, a sister, a brother, maybe the person that you chose to name as guardian, for example, okay, so that they have a copy. Another option is you can deposit an original with the inheritance registrar, okay? In Hebrew, that's okay. Rasham HaYerushot. That's the body that probates wills down the line. They also have a service of safekeeping wills. There's something convenient about it because that way you know it's on record, it's not going to get lost. And that's actually a good solution for people who don't trust themselves to hold on to it or are concerned about it getting lost or worse are concerned that family members may have an interest of making that will disappear. Okay. So if it's on file, the inheritance registrar, 
you know it's going to be discovered. Um, the way to do that, it used to be you had to go in in person, make an appointment, spend the morning depositing your will, uh, bureaucracy. That has improved over the last few years, and now you can do so remotely, but it is a two-step um, uh, process. You first log into um, the GovID system. You send a color copy. There's a small fee. I think it's around 110 shekels, something like that. Um, you, okay. you send in a scanned color copy, and then you mail in an original snail mail to their offices, and that's it. Then it's on file. Now, it's a good solution, but I don't necessarily recommend that everyone has to do that, especially when you're young, because when you're young, there's a good chance you're going to change the will down the line. And that does require, as of now, going physically to their offices, retrieving your older will and depositing the new one. So that could be a bit of a pain. So it, meaning in that, in that case, you probably would recommend just safekeeping it by yourself rather than rather than using this whole registrar process at all, correct? It, it's what people feel. Generally, I recommend right. you safe keep one and hand one copy to someone else whom you can trust, okay? Perfect. Um, I wouldn't say that as a blanket recommendation, everybody should deposit their wills. Got it, great. So can you give some, maybe some tips, some actions that people can take for free to start preparing for end of life decisions you know, maybe somebody at a very young okay. age, they want to. Yeah, I love this question forward. because lawyers generally don't talk about it, right? <laughs> like, why would they talk about things that people could do for free? Um, okay, <laughs> so first and foremost, yes, you could make a will for free, but of course, I'm not going to recommend doing that. And it's not just because, oh, I want the business, but because I've seen people who have created their own wills. I've seen these wills and they could make terrible mistakes. Okay. They could be unclear, they could be invalid, they could be missing important information, they could be missing important things. It's just not worth it. You know, tr transfer your will basically transfers everything you own. It's the largest transaction you'll ever make, so to speak. So you want to do it right. So while you could do that for free, I don't recommend it. What are things that you could do for free? Um, first of all, this, this has to do with sort of aging and planning for aging, not just for estate planning. So there's something called a yikui koach mitmashet. In English, we call it an enduring power of attorney or an ongoing power of attorney that covers what would, who would take care of me, who would make decisions for me if I become incapacitated. Um, and this covers medical decisions, financial decisions, and personal decisions. I'm not going to get into the whole, the whole details of what that is because it's not the topic of today's, uh, yeah. of today's podcast, but... What I wanted to say is if you want to create a full enduring power of attorney, yes, you have to go to a lawyer who's certified to do it. However, there is an option to create just an enduring medical power of attorney. That form is available online. Okay. You just Google medical power of attorney form D. Okay. It's available in English. It has to be signed in front of a professional, but you have a number of professionals. It could be a nurse, a doctor, a social worker, a psychologist, any lawyer, um, so that's, that's easy enough to find. And that, in, in that document, you're appointing somebody else to make medical decisions for you if you are unable to do so. Do I recommend signing the full enduring power of attorney that covers finances as well? Of course I do. But if you're not going to do that, at least go ahead and do the medical one. Medical. Okay, so that's one thing you can do. Another thing that's really important is documents for end of life decisions. That, believe it or not, is actually a separate power of attorney. Um, and here, too, the forms are available online. They're available in English, and they need to be signed in front of two witnesses. One type of form needs to be signed in front of a doctor or a nurse as well. But once again, those are things that, um, that you can do for free. Just Google Advanced Directives Health Ministry, and you'll find the page um, with some instructions on how to fill that out. Okay. Another important thing, this is, this is important for, <clears throat> for parents as they're starting to age. It is very, very helpful if you add one of your kids to your bank account. Okay, now there's the right way to do this and there's the wrong way to do this. The wrong way is adding them as co-owner. You're not making them co-owner of your account. They're not sharing the money in your account. They are there to help you. So the correct way to add them is as a power attorney. This, you do this at the bank. 
you go together, okay? Let's say mother and daughter go to the bank together. The mom says, I'd like to give my daughter power of attorney on my account. And they add her details, sign some papers, and give the daughter her own online access information. Okay, this is important because then when the mom is not feeling well, doesn't have the energy to deal with it, or doesn't have the technical know-how or the, know the, the language skills to do so, the daughter can call the bank and she doesn't have to pretend to be the mom. She could say, hi, I need access to this. I need to make that transfer um, and so on and so forth. So that is super important. Of course, choose someone whom you trust. Okay. You're adding someone to your bank account and giving them the ability to make transfers and payments on your behalf. It has to be someone that you trust, but that's a super important thing. One more thing that isn't free, but it's fairly inexpensive and could be helpful in some situations, especially for older or lean, is to sign a general notarized power of attorney to once again, someone whom they absolutely trust. What that is, it's not for incapacity. It's not uh, because they can't make their own decisions. It's just sort of saying here, I'm giving you power of attorney to take care of my finances. You talk to Bitoch Luby, you deal with the electric company, you deal with all those things for me. You're basically my messenger. Okay, so that is something that could be helpful um, in some uh, situations. Great. Those are all uh, a lot of good tips. I, I know there's some people watching this that are their heart is starting to beat a little bit faster when they think about spending a morning uh, in the bank and all the bureaucracy uh, of different steps that we talked about. But these things are very important. Uh, these things are, are, you know, adults have to deal with these these issues. Uh, we have to kind of better be you know, to be prepared uh, than, than to, uh, God forbid, be in one of these situations yes. uh, that we didn't Sooner rather than prepared. later. Yeah, I often see people who come to me after it's a little too late or almost too late, and it is so much harder to put a plan into place, to get the document signed, to take care of things when we reach that situation. So even though it's uncomfortable, even though we'd rather not see what's going on and ignore maybe the cognitive decline of our parents or of ourselves. Right. It's so much better to deal with in advance when the parent is still in control more than waiting for, for the last second. Yeah. No, and I, I mean, unfortunately, right, we're, we're recording this now in, in January 2024. Israel's in a state of war uh, at, that we've been in, ho hopefully. Uh, some people are watching this. Israel's no longer in a state of war. But, you know, a lot of people start start reaching out uh, when when these things happen and think about, um, you know, risk, risk to their lives and, and God forbid certain things that can happen. And we just want to be prepared. Right. We want to make sure that whoever we leave behind is, is in the best situation possible. Um, let's say, uh, you know, you've given us a ton of great information, a ton of tips and really, really helped us uh, get going here. Let's say somebody was ready to start um, looking into the process of of setting up a will, they're interested in your in your uh, offering uh, at Easy Will. Maybe explain the basic process, what it looks like to, to create a will using Easy Will, uh, and that I think is a great way to uh, sum, sum up our conversation. Okay, so the website is Easy Will C O I L. That's E the letter E the letter Z, and as I said, it's a platform on which you can easily create a good, thorough, legal Israeli will. Um, now there are different types of wills that you can create there and you have to start by choosing the workflow that's suitable for your circumstances, right? So if you're a couple and you have children under 18, that's one workflow. If your children are all adults, that's a different option. Same if you're single, basically it's all, it's all written out there on the website and you just choose the right one. Okay. Now I'm going to say now easy will is not for everyone. Okay. If you have difficult family circumstances, if we have a blended family, children with disabilities, um, if there is a child who we choose not to uh, bequeath to or not to include in our will, for all that, you need to go to a lawyer, okay? But if you would like to create what we consider the standard arrangement where you are leaving everything to your spouse and then to your children, then Easy Will can be a great solution for you. Once you choose the, um, the suitable workflow, you're, you start, it's very easy. You start inputting information and names into Dutz of Hoot numbers, um, ID numbers for everybody, for you and your children. And then it literally guides you through, it asks you questions, right? So it asks you some of the things that we spoke about. Are there large gifts that you gave to some children, but you haven't yet given to others? 
Who are the children who didn't receive the gift? Are there loans that you've given? Um, who do you want to name as guardian for your children who are minors? And here, by the way, <clears throat> there is an option not to name a specific person if you don't know who to choose, but rather to give some general guidelines, right? Like it's really important to me that they stay in Israel or it could be any of my siblings. You can give some different preferences. Um, same with if you're choosing to appoint a trustee to manage things to age 21 or 23. Throughout the process with the questions, there's some guiding text to explain the different options to you and tell you what you could choose. If you run into any trouble, you're unsure of something, at the bottom of every page, there's an option to save the link and continue later so that you can pick up where you left off. Um, there's an email address that you can reach out for support. Many people have done so. Um, they receive a response very quickly so that they can keep on going. Once you reach the end of the process, you have a chance to review all your answers and then you hit continue and literally 10 seconds later, you have uh, the PDF uh, documents of your wills ready to be downloaded and signed. Along with the wills, you also get detailed instructions on how to sign them correctly. Okay, step-by-step -step instructions uh, and say, you know, the questions about how to save, keep it, that's also in there. It's all there. It's very, very user-friendly. And it's there because I wanted to make this all doable, accessible, easy, and not as threatening and expensive as going out to a lawyer. Yeah, makes sense. And I've I've had a chance to go through EasyWill and it's really a great user-friendly platform. So, so you know, great job on that. And thank you. Really, we really, really appreciate you taking the time, Miriam, and, and going through all this. Just want to thank you. Thank you for coming on the show, for, for talking through all these kind of complex discussions, giving people a lot of value and, and important information that I think will, will help them uh, moving forward. And uh, th thanks for coming on the show. Of course. Yes, this was great. And I'm, I'm a big believer in giving people information, right, and, ha and making informed decisions. So for example, just going back to the mutual will thing, even if I think that maybe a mutual will isn't the best idea for the couple, I'm going to give them the option. I'm going to explain what it is and then they can make that choice. So, and that's why Easy Will, COIL also has quite a lot of informative articles about these things, about how to probate a will, what does it mean to choose a guardian, all those different things on the website and I'm constantly adding more information. So it's definitely worth checking out. Amazing. That's something that that definitely all of our, our readers at Blue, Blue White Finance can relate to. We really try to, to give people a lot of comprehensive information so that they can research these things on their own. They can get started with the process on their own. And, and in that, we really appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, be, be sure to check out everything on bluewhitefinance.com uh, and, and, uh, and keep, your, keep your learning going. And we'll see you on the next show.